I'm Caroline Mitchell and I'm an ex-police detective and crime thriller author and today I'm bringing you the case of the Candyman Killer. Now this true story is the last of my Halloween creepy crime series and it comes with a sting in the tail. Halloween is the one time of year that children are safe to roam the streets and take candy from strangers or at least that's how it's meant to be. I'm taking you to Deer Park in Pasadena and it's a suburb of Houston. It's considered one of the best places to live in Texas with good schools, friendly neighborhoods. But it's also an area that was blighted by the tragic murder of one of their own. It was Halloween 1984 when eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien waved goodbye to his mother, Dane, as he prepared to go trick-or-treating with his friends. He was dressed in his Planet of the Apes costume and accompanied by his father, Ronald O'Brien, his five-year-old sister, Elizabeth, and church friends, Mark and Kimberly Bates, who were chaperoned by their father, Jim. They lived in a nice, respectable neighborhood, which was considered a safe place for them to knock on doors. Ronald accompanied the children to the front door while Jim held back, waiting in the shadows as the children were given their treats. The children walked down Donnyrail Drive and the lights were out in one of the houses, which usually meant either the person living there was not taking part or maybe he was at work. But the kids rang the doorbell anyway and as there was no answer, they moved on. But Ronald hung back, just in case someone answered. And then minutes later, he caught up with the kids with five pixie sticks in his hand. Now for UK viewers, pixie sticks, I looked them up, they're basically flavored sugar that you suck up in a straw. I think we've got something similar here in the UK. These treats cost a little bit more, so they were considered quite the luxury for the children when they were given out. And Ronald made some remark about Jim living in a fancy neighborhood, saying that he'd keep the sweets for the kids for later on and give them back to him when he got home. It was raining and the kids were getting tired. So Jim and Ronald brought the kids back to Jim's place to go through their stash. Ronald divided out all the sweets and there was one pixie stick left over. So he said he'd keep that for himself. But then a bunch of trick-or-treaters arrived at the door and Ronald held up the pixie stick asking who wanted it. 11-year-old Whitney Parker shot up his hand as Ronald knew him from church so he gave it to him. That night when Timothy was going to bed he asked his dad if he could have one more treat and his dad gave him the pixie stick helping him open it so he could suck up the sugar with a straw. But not long after, Timothy took seriously ill and he rushed to the bathroom and he was cowering and crying as he was bent over in pain, asking for help. He was later brought to the hospital and within an hour of him eating the pixie stick, Timothy was dead. Bill Lanier, a Pasadena police sergeant, was sent to Southmore Hospital to investigate the sudden death of this young child. Bill took Ronald aside and a tearful Ronald told the sergeant what happened. The officer came to the conclusion that the candy was poisoned and the onus was on to warn the other children in the group. Ronald told the officer that the children had only visited two streets that evening due to the rain. And police knocked on 48 doors that night, collecting candy and checking on children. They discovered four more poisoned treats, the cyanide laced pixie sticks, Officers were relieved to discover that the candy hadn't been opened and no other children were hurt. But the neighborhood went into mourning for Timothy O'Brien, who was laid to rest on November the 2nd in 1974. Tears were shed for Ronald as he sang a moving solo in church before saying, I have peace now knowing Tim is in heaven. But who would want to poison innocent children and why? It was disturbing to know that there was a wolf in sheep's clothing living in their very neighborhood. Ronald told police that he couldn't remember where the pixie sticks came from. And he walked the neighborhood over and over again with police as he tried to remember where he'd got them. Police conducted their own inquiries and they were told that no one on that block gave out pixie sticks. But there was one household they had yet to speak to and that was the house with the lights off. It belonged to a Courtney Melvin. 
And as Ronald's memory came back to him, he said he remembered the door opening that night and a man's hairy arm giving him the pixie sticks. So police made their inquiries as Mr. Melvin became a person of interest. But the man had a strong alibi. He was working as an air traffic controller at Hobby Airport that evening. In fact, over 200 people confirmed seeing him that night, backing up his account that he didn't get home until 11 p.m. And Jim Bates, who was also chaperoning the children that evening, said he never saw the door open. So, the plot thickens. Police continued their inquiry as the alarm bells began to ring. I mean, who was lying? Ronald, Mr. Melvin, or Jim? Well, on Monday, November the 4th, the police spoke to an insurance agent by the name of Robert Bellew Jr., who notified them that Ronald had paid cash for a $20,000 insurance policy for each of his children on the 3rd of October, just weeks before Timothy's death. Mr. Bellew tried to steer Ronald to another policy which would give a payout when the children reached the age of 23, but Ronald wasn't interested in the long term. And he also said his wife didn't need to sign the policy and that Mr. Bellew should keep the policies for convenience. Now that's when the police knew who to shine the light of their investigation on. It seemed so horrific though to contemplate that a man of the church would give out enough poison to kill five children and two of them being his own. As the police dug further, they discovered that Ronald had also taken out two further insurance policies on his children. Added to the most recent policy, he stood to gain $60,000. They discovered that Ronald, who worked as an optician, was in serious financial trouble. He was in debt for a number of loans and the family had been forced to sell their homes to pay off some of their numerous debts. He even discussed his financial problems with some of his friends, saying that he'd been expecting a payout which would solve all their problems, but not where it was coming from. And he didn't do a very good job of covering his tracks. In August 1974, he tried but failed to buy cyanide where he worked at the Texas State Optical. He then went to a chemical supply company in Houston and a salesman recalled him trying to purchase small quantities of cyanide, but he left when he was told the smallest quantity they carried was five pounds. Just six days after Timothy's death, police indicted Ronald with a count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. He pleaded not guilty, protesting his innocence. The prosecutors used the physical evidence to convict him. It came to light that Ronald had taken a class at Harris County Community College and actually asked his teacher how much poison it would take to kill certain types of animals. They also had witness testimony from the wholesale chemical store claiming that he tried to buy cyanide. They also found pieces of pixie sticks in his house. Now Ronald's wife sat in the witness chair avoiding the gaze of her husband who was charged with killing their eight year old son. Her voice was low and even as she described her husband's behaviour after their son's death. He bet the wall and asked questions about why an eight-year-old boy had to die, she testified, and I didn't see any tears. She said that she knew nothing about the insurance policies which had been taken out on their children before Halloween. She said that she had only known of one $10,000 policy on the children, which was obtained through a bank service club and she had objected to them at the time. I tried to discourage him, she said, but he said it was the thing to do. We didn't have that much money, she said. And the insurance agent testified that his wife didn't know about the policies, even though he said she was aware at the time. On the 3rd of June, 1975, a jury found Ronald guilty of the murder of his son and the attempted murder of his own daughter, Elizabeth, his children's friend, Mark and Kimberly Bates, and the last trick-or-treater, 11-year-old Whitney Parker. The jury took 71 minutes to sentence him to death. His execution was scheduled for August the 8th, 1980, but there were delays, it was held up by appeals. Ronald's wife divorced him, saying, I'm glad it's coming to an end. I don't think Ronald is sick or insane, but he is perverted. 
It's the end of a nightmare and the beginning of a brand new beginning, she said when speaking of his death sentence. The slate will be wiped clean and we will get on with our lives. However, she did say she had no ill will against her ex-husband. I don't hate Ronald, she said. I just feel nothing. She remarried and continued her life, saying she felt a void following the death of her son, Timothy, but hoped that she and her 15-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, could put the ordeal behind them both. She said Elizabeth wanted to contact and visit Ronald on death row, but she adamantly prohibited it and saying that she didn't want her having any contact with her father. She has no ties with him, she said, and I think she has struggled with that. But she accepts the fact that he intended on killing her too. And this was before the trial in 1974, that she would visit her husband each week at the Harris County Jail, and each week he would cry and tell her of his innocence. He was so convincing sometimes, she said. What if he was telling the truth, but in the end, she said, I knew he was lying. Before her son's death, her husband made an appointment for her with an insurance agent to buy a life insurance policy for her. I really was the original intended victim, she said. The appointment was canceled because they didn't have the money to pay the policy premiums. I guess because she was older, perhaps the premiums were more expensive. She remembered once before Timothy's death that her husband quoted the Bible story about how Abraham must have felt about losing and sacrificing his only son. I just start putting those things together, she said. He was my husband and I wanted to believe him, but knowing him and living with him for almost 10 years, I knew it was possible. So she divorced Ronald and remarried and she never cashed the life insurance policy, calling it blood money. I can't say I blame her. Just months shy of the 10 year anniversary of Timothy's death, Ronald was given a lethal injection and he maintained his innocence until the very end. In his final statement, he said, what is about to transpire is very wrong. Whew, well, that was intense. Have you heard of this case? I had, but I was pleased to find the interview with his wife. I felt like it gave the story a bit more um, context. It's such a sad case, and for normal parents, this is incomprehensible. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your support. I have some really interesting unsolved mysteries and missing person cases coming up next month. So if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe so you don't lose me. <laughs> and remember, these crimes are rare, so don't let them play on your mind. Happy Halloween. Until next time.